Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark, and I'm a final year undergraduate in Central and Eastern European <coughs> Studies. Uh, today, I'm going to discuss how Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania have framed their tourism marketing since the um, since they regained their independence in 1991. Um, the first boom in global tourism happened in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, particularly in Western Europe. Um, tourism was made a lot easier by the Schengen area, which brought all of these countries over here closer by the abolition of land borders. Um, and then 10 years later, in 1995, we had the Channel Tunnel, bringing one of Europe's most isolated countries, the United Kingdom, um, into contact with the continent via the ocean. Um, Western European nations started to undergo a process called nation branding, which is when you commodify your culture, you turn your culture and everything about your national identity into a product that can be sold on the international market. Um, British millennials in the room might remember Cool Britannia, which was an early 1990s um, nation branding project that aimed to promote British art, music and fashion to show that we were a cool place to visit, whether or not you agree with that. Um, this campaign was incredibly successful, but in Eastern Europe, um, these countries were not able to take part in this boom in tourism, um, mainly because they were sealed behind the wall just here, the inner German, the inner German border or the Berlin Wall, which kept um, the Eastern and Soviet blocs closed off from foreign travel, and also they were not allowed to leave the, um, the bloc, or most often they were not allowed to leave the country they were born in. Um, after 1991 and the restoration of independence in the Baltic states, which are three countries just up here, you've got Estonia in the north, Lithuania in the middle, and Latvia in the south. Um, they were able to join the global tourism industry, albeit as latecomers. Um, but since 1991, the Baltic states have identified three main areas of tourism they want to endeavour to, um, to develop um, in order to project an authentic cultural experience to anyone that chooses to visit. Uh, the first type of tourism that they've been getting involved in is ecotourism. Um, it's the, the region is known for some of the best undisturbed landscapes in Europe, largely due to Soviet land mismanagement. Um, rural areas were neglected, including forests, um, and most industry was concentrated in cities um, and large towns. Um, this is probably the best known global example. This is the Grand Canyon. Um, millions every year are spent by the US uh, Department of the Interior preserving um, what is one of the world's best known ecotourism sites. Um, the second type of tourism is memory tourism. Um, it's the travel to sites of great historical notability. Um, globally, the world's best memory sites or best preserved are in the USA. Um, they're a very wealthy and also very young nation, so they've been able to preserve their memory sites very well. Um, this is Ford's Theatre in Washington, D.C. Um, it's one of the city's most visited um, memory sites. It's where Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. So um, that's a pretty big tourism draw for them. Um, lastly, and particularly in the former Eastern Bloc, um, dark tourism is a, a rising phenomenon that's become more closely entwined with memory tourism. Um, this is the visit to sites of things like massacre, war, natural disaster or extreme deprivation. It's the type of tourism that preys on a traveller's natural morbid curiosity. Um, this is arguably the world's best known dark tourism site. Uh, it's Auschwitz Birkenau concentration camp um, in Lower Poland. Um, it's so popular that it's Lonely Planet's number one tourist attraction in Poland, out of everything in Poland. Um, so this research analysed entries on the public, government run, government funded, tourism portals for Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania um, and analysed articles, the text and the images um, under three main themes, um, legacies of occupation, national languages and how they're promoted to tourists um, and also natural environments. Um, and this research aims to assess how these countries use tourism to either come to terms with a darker past or how they use it today to promote their national identity. Um, firstly, I've looked at entries that memorialise the occupation. Uh, all three of these countries were occupied by the Soviet Union from 1944 all the way up until 1991. Um, and I'm going to compare the attitudes and approach to Soviet ideological monuments to victory in the Second World War. Um, this is Victory Park. Um, it's a monument park in central Riga, the capital of Latvia. Um, towards tourists, Latvia are the most positive about the occupation. 
They describe the monuments with words like awe and admiration, and they also make um, a point to admit how important the Soviet occupation is to Latvian history as a whole. Um, but what is important to note is that Riga um, has a very large Russian minority um, who might not necessarily see this as a monument to a darker past. Um, whereas the equivalent, this is uh, Grutas Park in Lithuania, just outside of Vilnius, um, it's the resting place of all Soviet ideological monuments erected in Lith Lithuania during the occupation. Um, they're a little bit more neutral in their tone towards, uh, towards the, the, the site. They, um, they note how rare it is to have so much ideology in one place. Uh, it's a unique, a unique draw, but where they differ from Latvia is that they've taken a more out of sight, out of mind approach. Uh, Grutas is a small, a very small town, about 45 minutes outside of Vilnius, the capital. Um, it's got a low population and this area is mostly visited by tourists rather than uh, Lithuanians themselves. Um, however, Estonia's equivalent site, the Bronze Soldier of Tallinn, um, it's a source of great shame for Estonians, um, especially ethnic Estonians, um, who see it as a monument to a terrible time. Um, in 2007, in the middle of the night, the Estonian government had the monument moved from central Tallinn to a military cemetery in suburban Tallinn. Um, and ever since then, they've removed any mention of it from government websites. As you can see, there is no entries on uh, visitestonia.com, even though this is an important a monument to, to the Russian population in Estonia and also to the Estonians who have, uh, who had family members in the, uh, the Red Army during the Second World War. They've chosen to completely ignore it. Um, next, I'm comparing how national languages are portrayed to tourists. Um, national languages are extremely important expressions of nationalism in the Baltic states um, because uh, from 1944 to 1991, the only legal language in all three of these countries was Russian. They were not allowed to use their own ethnic language. Um, Latvia are the most neutral in the way they approach their language. Um, they strongly promote the Latvian language and they talk about its roots. Um, Latvian people are very proud of their language, that is true. But they do make a specific note to point out that Russian is widely spoken and um, they don't they don't make a big deal out of it. They acknowledge that there's a large population in Riga um, and Latvia's second biggest city, Daugavapils, is entirely Russophone. Um, everyone speaks Russian. Lithuania, however, are incredibly defensive, uh, very aggressive about their national language. They emphasise how unique it is, how difficult the language is to learn, how much of a, a, a joy it is for them to speak it. But they describe having to defend Lithuanian from Russian influence um, in the 20th centuries, and they talk today about how they had to defend it from English, um, English influence. So to them, their language is an immense source of national pride, and they hang a lot of their national identity on their language as well. Um, Estonia take a different approach. They're the least nationalistic. Um, they don't see their language as an outright expression of their national identity. Um, they promote it alongside a range of minority languages like German and Russian, but they strongly promote Estonian bilingualism. Um, this kind of alludes to Estonia wanting to portray themselves as the most European of the Baltic states. Um, they want themselves to be seen as a mobile nation. Um, they want to travel through Europe and they want Europe to travel to them as well. Um, they want to align themselves closer with the EU than the other two perhaps. Um, and lastly, I've looked at how these states advertise their na uh, natural environments and how this highlights their attitudes to the past and also their national identities. Um, in Latvia, they promote a sense of exceptionalism. This is where Latvia uh, have a lot of pride. Latvia has an incredible, incredibly diverse uh, flora, fauna, wildlife um, that's all native to Latvia um, and they put a lot of emphasis on that. Um, whereas the Lithuanians, they are nationalistic in a slightly different way. They talk again about the territorial integrity, um, how they have to conserve and protect the Lithuanian land for the future. Um, and they also talk a little bit about the neglect of the land through the 20th century um, and how undisturbed it is due to this. Um, so uh, conservation is a massive focus for Lithuanians. Um, Estonia approached the environment quite similarly to how they approached their language. 
Um, they discuss how the freedom to roam all of, the, all of Estonia is enshrined in their basic law. Um, this is an allusion perhaps to the freedom of movement that is such an important pillar in the European Union. Um, it could also be argued that it's an allusion to the occupation. Um, Estonians were not freely allowed to roam. Most people were restricted to the city that they lived and worked in. Um, if you wanted to move, you often needed permission. Um, so the sense of freedom is very important, not only to a European identity, but to an Estonian identity as well. Um, so in conclusion, Estonia are the most unwilling, arguably, to come to terms with the past, um, especially in the realm of tourism. Um, however, they do anchor their national identity quite heavily to Europe um, and they want to promote a lot more European ideals and aims as opposed to the other two states. Um, Latvia take the most neutral approach. Um, they, they choose not to put down the past or confront it as necessarily a dark thing, um, but they do accept that it's something that happens and it's, it is important to them. Um, but Lithuania are the most overt in both the promotion of their national identity and also the othering of the Russian population um, and the occupation, um, the occupation as well. Um, they express an immense desire for territorial linguistic integrity. Um, they, they, they want to keep the past at arm's length and move forward as an independent Lithuania. Um, so hopefully you've got some idea what these three countries are about. I would recommend you go and visit if you've never been. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Amon Cheskin who supervised the research and Imogen Herbert who mentored the presentation and also the team at Leeds who provide really good platforms for undergraduates to showcase their work. Um, if anyone wants anything more to read or wants to talk to me more in depth about it, I've left my email. Um, alternatively, you can harass me in the street. Um, but thank you so much for listening and does anyone have any questions?